This is Doug Parker. He flew all the way from California to come talk to you about his area of expertise, which at this moment is California drought, which is, as you all know, a huge problem, a wicked problem. And I am assuming he's making great hay headway in it. So let's do it one last time for our last speaker. Lots of love. Cheer him on, Doug Parker. Check. Check, check. This one works. Check. Works here. Okay. Figure it out. Not going through or under anything. Okay. All right. <laughs> right and really right back at all of you for staying and going through the whole day. This has been an amazing day of learning. Um, the fellows, I want to I want to thank all of you because I have learned more about system thinking today than I have by reading books and by playing on the web. Um, but being around and seeing it applied, and that's what it's about. You know, that's what we're here to do. We're not here to just say, hey, I use a model, whoopee. We're, we're here to say, you know, how might that change the world? How might that change something for somebody? How might it make somebody better off? So I think that's very important for all of this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, systems thinking and, and some of my work in California. Um, I very carefully chose this title here, and I want you to keep it in mind as we go through this journey today um, when we get all the way to the end of the talk today. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about California and the drought and probably a not a lot of you here are from California and actually I found out when I worked in California I'm from California but most of the people in California I work with are not from California as well um, so we need a little bit of background to understand what's going on in California so this is this is a uh, diagram here of river flow in our major river the Sacramento River in Northern California which produces um, the majority of our water supply and this is annual river flow in that river. And what you can see from this river flow, of course, is that things are not very stable in California. We have wet years, we have above normal years, we have below dry, critically dry. We rarely have normal, okay? It's wet or it's dry. And we're in year six starting this year of dry, okay? But we have very big variation each year, okay, between years. We also have variation within years, and I didn't bring that one, but if you look at them, there's a, a map that looks at the whole U.S., and California has the most variable weather of anywhere in the U.S. as well. Um, if you look at, say, out here, you get about 50% of your rainfall in about 80 days, okay? In California, you get 50% of your rainfall in about eight days, okay? We get most of our um, water supply in three to five storm events during the year, okay? So if you miss two of those storm events, you're in bad shape, okay? Um, we also have a lot of variability in our water supply. This is precipitation, and what this shows you is it rains in the mountains, and it rains near the coast in the north, okay? Two-thirds of our water comes from the northern one-third of the state. Two-thirds of our water demand is in the southern two-thirds of the state, okay? So we've got a geographic problem. What do you do about that? Well, to go back to sort of the first wave, or maybe even part of the second wave we were talking about this morning, you engineer the heck out of it, right? We have the most complex water system in the world in California. We've got, this is just dams and reservoirs and canals, okay? We've got thousands of miles of canals in California to move water where rivers won't naturally move it for us. Uh, we've got 43 million acre feet worth of, worth of storage in California that helps us get through the year and it helps us get between the years as well. <clears throat> so we have lots of engineering solutions We've been engineering the state for 100 years plus, um, and yet we still have drought. We still have problems. 
So why is this? Well, I've been thinking about it for the last six years. My phone's been ringing off the hook. My email goes nuts um, with requests from reporters to do interviews. Okay, and I've been doing newspaper interviews, radio interviews, blog interviews, uh, TV interviews all over the place. And the question keeps coming back to me, to me. How do we solve the drought? And I've been thinking about that question for a long time now. And what I've come to, under, to decide is it's not the right question, okay? And how does systems thinking lead me to that, okay? It's not the right question to say, how do we solve the drought? We're starting our conversation from the wrong point here. So let's take a look at uh, this question from sort of a systems thinking perspective. And we've been hearing about DSRP today um, in, in a lot of different talks. And remember, it's not DSRP. It could be DPRS or whatever it is to you in any given situation. And those things mix and match depending on, on your own personality and your own background, where you are with a lot of them. Um, but let's look at what the problem is in California and what are we looking for. Okay, when I get this question, how do I solve the drought? People are looking for a solution. So I went and I looked in the dictionary. Okay, I said, well, what does that mean? Okay, and I looked it up and, and solution, it says solution, something that is done to deal with and end a problem. Okay, so problem, not enough water, end the problem, bring it into balance. Okay, <clears throat> I see this as sort of, okay, you've got distinction coming into play here. You've got uh, relationships coming into play to create that balance, but you're kind of ignoring the system and you're probably ignoring some of the perspective as well. And so I tried to look a little bit further at this idea of a solution and to ending the problem. Um, and I thought a little bit more about it and I thought, well, when we want to end a problem, what, what are people seeking? Well, they're looking for stability, right? We all like stability in life. People don't like change, you know, they don't like big change especially, um, but even small changes. So people are looking for stability. Um, and I looked that up, and stability is the quality or state of something that is not easily changed or likely to change. Okay, so we've got some balance here to get to stability. I'm going to have to understand the systems in order to figure out how to make that happen. And then I think a little bit more about the stability issue. Okay, and I think, well, stability is nice, but what's even better? Sustainability, right? And we all love sustainability, so I, and I ran to the dictionary. Actually, I probably Googled it. Um, and looked it up, and sustainability, able to last or continue for a long time. And this is providing for me sort of this perspective question of, well, how do we find that solution? What is it that lasts for a long time? And again, using systems thinking in the fourth wave, number four here that we've been talking about all day, um, lets me think a little bit more about these viewpoints on this, okay? So let's return okay to our question that we've been looking at of how do i solve the problem of drought in california and for two reasons i would argue you can't it cannot be solved first of all okay in our linear models and I've, i'm an economist as well so so i can i can point back to some of these things but in economics generally we think of efficiency and storage as two offsetting things in water right if i want to bring that water into balance i can become more efficient and need less water, I'm closer to a balance. Or I can build more storage, increase supply. Again, I'm coming closer into balance. So I can trade those off, I can move them around and get myself into balance. There's a problem with that, at least in California. Efficiency and storage don't always move like that. They actually often move in the same direction. Okay, and I'll give you an example from agriculture in California. Suppose you're a tomato grower, okay? You wanna become more efficient. You install a drip irrigation system in your tomato field. In fact, 85% of our uh, processing tomato fields have drip irrigation systems in them. Okay, you just invested $3,000 an acre in equipment, okay, and a loan from the bank for that tomato field, okay? Well, does that increase or decrease your demand for storage? I would argue it increases the demand because you better be growing tomatoes every year in order to pay back that system, okay? So you wanna be sure you've got water. It increases your demand for that water, and they move in the same direction. So systems thinking sort of upends this traditional, they trade off with each other. Hey, maybe they actually move in the same direction. Well, that makes it difficult to solve the problem, doesn't it? Um, perspective number two, California's a big state. We've got about 100 million acres of land in the state. 
about a fourth of that, 26 million of that is agricultural acreage. And of that, about nine and a half million acres is irrigated agricultural land in this state, okay? So land is essentially unconstrained in California, right? When I wanna talk about irrigated land, I've got 100 million acres, well obviously some of that can't be farmed. But 26 million acres of it is farmed, 13 and a half million I mentioned is, is pasture and rangeland, okay? So if I get more water, what do I do? I got more land, I can make more food. It's the same with the irrigation and the tomatoes as well. If I go and save water on irrigating my tomatoes, what's my response? My response is to grow some more tomatoes and get some more land, okay? So California being land rich and water poor um, returns me to the question of how do we solve the drought? And I realized that it's not solvable in that sense. I'm starting from the wrong question. Because what happens if I try to solve the drought? Well, I can increase supply, I can increase water, uh, decrease water demand, and try to bring it more into balance. Okay, that will bring it more into balance. Um, but what does that make me do? I increase the amount of land that I irrigate. I increase future demand for water in California, and now I'm back out of balance. This is similar to the freeway paradox, right? We've all seen this one, right? You build more houses, you create congestion on the freeway, there's demand for more lanes, you build some more lanes on the freeway, congestion goes down, what's your response? Build more houses and repeat. So system thinking allows us to use tools such as DSRP to understand and influence the world around us. That's what we wanna do with all of that, okay? So in California, the question of how do we solve the drought is not the right question. But now let's apply system thinking to it, okay, and think about it. Um, because what, what we can end up with is say, well, how do we solve the drought? I just told you we can't solve it. Well, is that depressing news then? Do we just all throw up our hands and say, I don't, you know, I'm done. I can't figure it out. I can't solve the drought. No, actually, it's not that way. It's actually an opportunity, right, to figure out, okay, well, how do we change that? So I would say what we do is how do we change the question from how do I solve the drought to how do I thrive in an ever-changing and uncertain environment, right? How do we embrace change? How do we um, make our environment how we want given what we're faced with, okay? So it doesn't mean don't increase efficiency, don't build more storage, don't build a desalination plant, but don't think that you're going to solve the drought by doing it. You may make yourself better off and it may be the right thing to do. Um, I wanted to end with one quote. I was at a meeting last week, um, and my favorite facilitator in all of California, Joseph McIntyre, he's a great guy to work with. We're at this meeting and we're deconstructing things, and, we're, and there's a lot of stakeholders in the room, and this is where I see the benefit from, from sort of mental models and system thinking. And Joseph has never studied this that I know of, but Joseph, and I wrote this down when he said it, he said, mental models that restrict us from moving forward become opportunity when deconstructing. And I think that is the lesson we want to take home from today, is that these actually are opportunities we're looking at in ways to further and benefit ourselves and our world.